Hello, everyone. We're very happy to be in Vancouver with you, with you today. And today we're going to talk about uh, an interesting network kernel bug we, we found uh, a while back. And so how it, um, how it impacted our workloads, how we debugged it, and how we fixed and mitigated it. So before we start, let's introduce ourselves. I'm Laurent Bernay. Um, I work at Datadog in the infrastructure teams. And, and I'm Eric Mountain. I also work in the infrastructure teams. Sorry. Um, more specifically, I work in the Kubernetes teams. Uh, we deliver the Kubernetes clusters that run all the services that Datadog uh, runs on. And so this isn't about Datadog, but just I'll introduce Datadog very briefly. Um, we're a cloud-based uh, monitoring and security uh, system. So we have lots and lots of integrations that allow monitoring different pieces of software. We're now over 5,000 uh, strong. And we have millions of hosts reporting into Datadog, um, sending us trillions of points every day. So that makes for a lot of, a lot of traffic uh, and quite a sizable infrastructure. So we have tens of thousands of nodes uh, split over dozens of Kubernetes clusters. So, yes, as I said, we're not, we're not here to talk about Datadog, but about a problem that we, we observed. And um, so it started with folks coming to us saying, hey, we're, we're being paged at night. Um, our application is, is lagging. We, we have, uh, we're, we're seeing issues with some applications consuming from Kafka. And the throughput we get does not align with the instance type. So that's a nice way of saying that the, the throughput is really bad because no one would complain if it were too high, right? Um, looking a little bit more closely, uh, one of the things that comes to light is that we have an 8Q uh, card, network card, but all of the traffic is leaving on one single queue, Q0. Based on this, we start, you know, trying to do bandwidth tests, that kind of thing. So quickly cobble together test with iperf. And we see that if we go host to host, we're at about 23 gigabits per second, which is close to the limit for this instance type. Um, but if we go from a pod to another host, we're down to 16 gigabits per second for exactly the same test. Taking this a little bit further, we, we start using Flint. So Flint is a, an opinionated framework for network uh, bandwidth and latency testing. Uh, the advantage with this, rather than our cobbled together iperf uh, test, is that it's, as I said, opinionated. So it has its own structure. It knows how to launch a certain number of things that will saturate links and things like that. So that's pretty good. And so here what we see is that we're at about 16 gigabits per second, which is the same uh, as what we saw in the previous slide for the pod to host traffic. Um, but we've also got very high latency here. We're around 10 milliseconds. So at this point, what we've got is folks complaining that they're getting paged. Um, it's relate, so far relating to two applications running in AWS. And the symptoms are that we have packet drops and therefore retransmits. Uh, we've got so this is a situation that changed, right? Initially, people weren't being paged, and then they started being paged. So, so we're, we're now seeing lower throughput than the, the setup that works, and we've got higher latency. The consequences here is that uh, we're having to run more processing pods in order to compensate, right? We scale horizontally in order to compensate, and so it's costing us a lot more money. Um, so if we backpedal a little bit to this single transmit queue business, why, why is that an bad or an impact or whatever? So for one thing, it means that there's a single CPU that's handling all the completion IRQs. So once a packet's been sent by the network card, it's reporting back via an IRQ, and all these IRQs are coming to the same CPU because they're all from the same transmit queue, and the transmit queues are mapped to CPUs for the IRQ handling. Um, so it makes it harder to get, so, so this is something that we talked to AWS about as well, and one thing that they told us, well, a few things they told us are that it's harder to get to the maximum instance throughput if you're using a single transmit queue. Um, and in particular, well, you can get full bandwidth on certain instance types, like the very large ones, 
uh, but it can re depend as well on the the family of the instances and the generation, like very old generations, you will never manage to get the full bandwidth on a single transmit queue. Um, so, I mean, I mean, I don't know how it works exactly, but I can take a guess that it's a bit like a CPU, a generic CPU, where you have pipelining and different stages of pipelines can run in parallel to process instructions. Well, here, the network cards likely are sending on the wire the a packet from one transmit queue while they're dequeuing from another transmit queue, etc. So it increases the parallelism that the card can have. I mean, at a guess. Um, so how does this work if we, if we look at um, the, 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 the stack on, on Linux? So we have the, the network card, the virtual network card. Um, the card presents a certain number of transmit queues. So let's say eight, because that's what we have in our examples. These are actually mapped to, well, they have queuing disciplines ahead of them. So in our setup, the default setup uh, for, for the operating system we were using, in fact, it's uh, fqcoddle. So fqcoddle is flow queue control delay. Uh, it's, a, it's a certain algorithm for dealing with uh, shunting packets around and deciding what is the next packet that should be, that should be handled, etc. So I'll talk about that a bit more in a, in a minute. Um, and ahead of this is the root uh, queue discipline, which is multi-queue, and it's a very simple one. It's pretty transparent. What it expects is to receive from the IP stack a packet that already has a transmit queue set, and it will then just simply send the packet on to the queuing discipline that matches that transmit queue. Okay, um, I didn't expect to have that slide there. So if we look at some of the, the Q discipline stat statistics, um, we see that uh, indeed, if we, if we look at the Q discipline statistics, we see that all of the packets are being sent on the Z Q0 um, and none on the others. So we haven't shown all eight, but you get the drift. And so, essentially, what's happening here is that we've got all these queuing disciplines and all these transmit queues, and everything is just going where the red line is at the top here, okay? If we go back to the numbers, we see that um, one interesting thing is that we actually have drop packets on that queue discipline zero. Uh, and it's quite a significant number, 2%. That, that's an awful lot. So if we look at fqcoddle in a little bit more detail, how does it work? So there's a stream of packets that need to be sent from different flows. Um, and so the first thing that's done is that a hash is calculated for the, for the, on the flow, on the, on the, uh, yeah, on the flow. And that allows to dispatch the packet onto one of a number of queues. Uh, then from there, there's a round robin algorithm that will pick off packets from these different queues uh, based on how recent they are and uh, when they were well, when they were last uh, taken, when bytes were taken off them, etc. And this will be then the packets that are forwarded on to the transmit queues themselves. Um, so one thing, coddle here, control delay. So this is active queue management, basically. It is actively deciding to potentially drop packets if they are queued for too long. The reason for this is that CODL, the idea is that it's to prevent buffer bloat. Buffer bloat is, for instance, when you have, um, you can have a nominal stable state where you've got a rather high throughput, um, but your queues are fairly full. And so the latency is actually quite high, even though you're getting good throughput. And the idea, of FQCoddle is to prevent that kind of situation from lasting. It tries to eliminate it by dropping packets and therefore forcing the TCP uh, protocol into managing the congestion window, uh, backing off a bit, slowing down, that kind of thing. So this is, Coddle here is likely why we've got dropped packets. Um, so now let's try and see if we can hone in on what exactly is broken. So our network setup looks like this. 
um, the host has its host network namespace. It has a primary network interface card through which all the host traffic goes, uh, comes and goes. The pods, they have their own network namespaces. They have their own IP and all their traffic goes through secondary NICs. So here there's only one. If we had many pods, we might need a se uh, more secondary NICs uh, because you can only have so many uh, ENI IPs per, per NIC. What we know is that what we're seeing is the, 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 pod, traffic, the pod egress traffic being impacted. Um, so that's the traffic here going through NS6. And, but what about receive? And actually, well, receive is fine. So it's balanced across all the receive queues. So we've got no problem there. Host traffic, well, we've done a benchmark. We can see that that works fine. Okay. What if we send the host traffic through ENS6 instead? Uh, well, that works fine too. So maybe it's our CNI plugin. So we use Cilium. Um, so maybe let's just try and do a simple network namespace setup by hand. Uh, for one thing, this is a setup where we won't have the Cilium BPF programs loaded. So if we reproduce the issue, we know it's not the Cilium BPF programs. Um, so we start off by creating a network namespace. In there, we create a VEs, which is basically a wire with two ends. And we put one of those ends in the network namespace that we've created. We allocate an IP to that uh, to the end that's inside the network namespace, the, and we arrange for uh, packets going out of the pod to go to the host. Um, I've forgotten one. No, that's right. Okay, and also we then add a route so that at the host level so that traffic coming from the pod uh, will be routed out through ENS6 and we have a rule to say that anything that is destined for the pod goes on the VETH into the pod network namespace. So now we have a network namespace that's fully configured. Uh, what happens? So from our tests what we see is that we actually have the same issue here. So we've um, managed to prove at least that the EBFPF programs of Cilium are not the cause here. But we have something going on uh, with, our, with our transmit queue set up all the same. Um, so another thing we can do now that we know how to set up our own manual uh, network namespaces, we can try putting trans tra more transmit queues on the V inside our own network namespace, the pod network namespace as it were. And that's interesting because it actually fixes the issue if we have the same number of transmit queues as on the actual network card, the physical network card. Um, but it's still not ideal because, I mean, it doesn't fix it. If, if the number isn't exactly the same, then the behavior still reverts to everything going to through the transmit queue zero. Another thing we tried was to use FEQing instead of FQCODL. Uh, so the difference here is, uh, so although it might not be intuitive, uh, this is something I discovered, FEQing is actually more recent than FQCODL. Um, so the thing, the idea here is, for instance, within data centers, you don't necessarily need, um, or for servers, you don't necessarily need the CODL aspect, the active queue management aspect of FQCODL. And so FQ is basically that part ripped out. Um, so you take traffic uh, packets, you distribute them across queues uh, for each flow, and the round robin algorithm picks them off and pushes them off onto the, to the queue. And so when the queue is full, what you expect is simply to have back pressure, which will lead to or dropping. Um, and so the, the server application will forcibly slow down because it can't queue the, queue the packets. Um, so interestingly, there with FQ, we do actually mitigate the issue. We have the native performance, the native throughput of the instance type, 25 gigabits per second, and we, we have um, around two millisecond latency, which is five times less than the, the other test. <clears throat> 
Now, if we start looking at the nodes, we've, we've now got a situation where it's easy to check different nodes. And what we see is that AWS instances with Ubuntu 24.2 plus are impacted. 24.1 is not impacted. And GCP instances are not impacted, regardless of the version. So at this point, AWS Ubuntu 24.2 nodes have the network issues. The issue is that traffic goes over a single transmit queue. Um, we're using FQ Coddle. If we switch to FQ, then it mitigates the issue. Um, and GCP nodes are not impacted. So we could stop here and say, OK, we use FQ, but that would be relatively unsatisfactory. So now we need to figure out how we can debug this. And Laurent's going to talk about that. Yeah, so as, as Eric said, um, we had mitigations, but they were not satisfactory. The first one is because we could use FQ, but we're not convinced that it's the best approach. And also, uh, having multiple transmit queue on the VS device would be challenging because we use instance type of different sizes. Some of them are pretty big with eight transmit queue. Some of them are very small with single one. So we need logic to make sure that the number on the virtual center device would match the number on the physical device. But more importantly, it makes no sense. I mean, it works on all the kernels, doesn't work on new ones, and we want to understand why. So the first question is we want to understand and we want to answer is how do we pick the queue, right? And it's actually easy. You can just look at the kernel code. Well, I'm saying easy, to be honest, it took us quite some time. So this is a very simplified uh, transmit sequence, right? When a packet is, is when the routed decision has happened and the packet has to be sent, uh, the first thing you do is you call devq xmit, which is going to send the, uh, the, the packet through the device. And two important things happen there, right? The first thing is we call the function called netdev core pick tx, right? And this function is supposed to pick the queue. And then you go to the transmit function itself, which will first run QDisk and then invoke the um, transmission function from the uh, driver itself. So let's dive into uh, netdevcore peak tx. I'm, I'm sorry, it's going to be a mouthful because kernel function names tend to be long, so sorry. <laughs> so the, the first, I mean, this function is actually pretty simple. Uh, it's like not even 20 lines. And you can see here that there's a simple test at the beginning, which is, does a device have more than one queue? Of course, this is a single queue. It makes little sense to pick a queue. And something interesting is happening next. Um, you see the test there. Oops, uh, and you select queue, right? This is testing if the driver has provided a specific select queue function. And if it has, then we're gonna call the select queue function from the, from the driver. And otherwise, we're gonna use netdevpicktx. And remember this one because we're gonna see this one quite a few times. So at this one, we're like, well, maybe we can explain the difference between AWS and GCP because the drivers are different. So we looked at the kernel code uh, for, for, for these two drivers. And on AWS, we use the ENA driver. And on GCP, we use the Virtio one. And as you can see here, on the GCP driver, you have the full struct. And you can see that we're not implementing select queue, right? So we're using the default from the kernel. However, on the AWS side, the ENA driver actually supplies a function. So maybe we're onto something there, right? So let's look at this function. So in a select queue, the function provided by the AWS ENA driver um, defaults to using netdev peak take, so the function that is the default one used by GCP. So, but it looks like we're not doing that, right? Because it's working on GCP, but it's not working on AWS. So maybe there's something happening in this test here. So before we dive into this test, let's take a quick step back. You'll, I'm going to mention SKB quite a few times. So, an SKB, or SKBuff for long, is the main networking structure in the kernel. So it has metadata about, about the packet, right? So there's no actual data, only pointers to data, and, but there's all the metadata. So the structure is very, very, very big. So I highlighted only a few parts of it. Um, so things that, are, that we're gonna use later, the, the device. So the device that is used uh, to transmit the packet or the device on which the packet was received. And at the very end, all the pointers to different parts of the packet. So you have the network header, which is where you get the IP information. You have the transport header, which is where you have the TCP or UDP headers, and, and so on. Something that will be very important for the rest of the presentation is this small field here, which is called queue mapping. 
and it's, it seems very interesting, right? It says queue mapping for multi-queue devices, exactly what we want to look at. So something that's important is, depending on where you are in the kernel, in which function is using uh, this field, it means a slightly different thing. When you're sending the packet, so we're actually uh, sending it on the wire, this means which queue you're gonna use, right? However, if you're in the function picking a queue, if it's zero, it will mean that the queue has already been picked by another component in the kernel. And if it's zero, it means you have to go through the um, action of selecting the queue. So let's get back to ENA select queue. So the first check here, which is checking if queue mapping is different from zero, is verifying if the queue has been recorded by another component. Right, so if it's true, it means that we already have the information, in which case, we're going to restore it, right? So, and the, the way it works, as I was saying before, is like to, to store queue information, you just uh, add one, and to uh, restore it, you subtract one, which means zero, means the queue hasn't been selected, you can put pretty much do whatever you want, but if it's greater than zero, it has already been picked. So what we want to do now is see what the value is at different step in the kernel. And this used to be pretty difficult, right? But we're very lucky now because we have eBPF in the kernel, which means we can use BPF trace and add hook points at different functions in the kernel to see what's happening. And you can see here this very simple BPF trace code, which is about 10 lines, is going to allow us to actually look at what's happening at different steps in the kernel and look at the content of the queue mapping field of the SKB struct. So you can see here it's pretty simple. I mean, this function is def, def -X -mit, so the initial function called when we're sending a packet in a device. And it takes an SKB as the first argument, which is why we're looking at, at arg zero. We have the field queue mapping, of course, which is the one we're most interested in. We also can, we can also pick the network device. And the last few lines are just a very ugly way to make sure that we're uh, filtering traffic for a specific IP, which makes testing easier, right? So, what do we get? So, with, we run this BPF, we load this BPF trace program, and then we run a simple ping from a network namespace uh, on, a, on one of our nodes. And you can see here that we're calling this function twice, which makes sense if you remember our setup, right? We called it once in the pod network namespace, and then one on the host network namespace. And uh, the, the number after dev actually the device indexes of the different devices, and I put the name because it's easier. So, ECH0, uh, is actually the device inside the, the name of the device inside the pod network namespace, and ENS6 is the one on the host network namespace. So what's interesting here is the queue mapping field has a different value in both places. It's zero in the pod network namespace, and it's one in the host network namespace. And it's always the same, right? Because of course, it, 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 it could be one one time, right? But it, it, it should vary, but it never varies. So at this point, we have this program that works, but it doesn't give us much. But what we can do, because we have BPF trace, is we can instrument many functions in the kernel. And this is what we did. So we instrumented a few key functions to see what was happening. So here, we instrumented all the functions responsible for sending the packet inside the pod network namespace. And you can see here that we start with devqxmit, and we end up with vsxmit, which is the function of the vs driver to send a packet. Once we reach VS ISMIT, we actually leave the pod network namespace and we enter the host. At this point, if you remember what Eric said before, we have to route the packet, which is why we go through all the routing functions in the kernel, and the kernel will decide at this point that we need to send the packet on ENS6. And then we get to the final part, which is transmission again, uh, but this time in the host network namespace on ENS6, right? And now that we're here, let's look at the queue mapping field, right? So in the pod network namespace, it's zero, which kind of makes sense, right? We have a single transmit queue, so it makes no sense to pick it. At the very end, uh, ENS select queue actually has queue mapping set to one, and if you remember the code, it means the queue has been recorded, which means we restore it back to zero. And this means that every single time we're gonna pick zero, because every single time we're gonna hit the ENA select queue function, the queue mapping will be set to one, so the queue will be considered recorded, and we'll just subtract one and use zero, which is the first transmit queue. So now we know why we, why we have the issue. What makes very little sense, though, is this here, this transition. 
why do we go from zero to one when we cross the network namespace boundaries? So we looked at, the, at a few functions, and, and, and after looking at VS XMIT, we discovered this line there. And you can see at the very end that we're actually recording the queue. I'm like, okay, and we look at this, we read it a few times, I'm like, well, we should be always recording the queue, so we should be impacted everywhere, and should have been the case forever. So we're like, maybe something changed in the kernel. So we used Git, and we found this very small <laughs> patch, right? So there was actually an optimization in um, an idea that in some cases, when you were using XDP, you might want to record the receive queue uh, to have the information when you transmit, so you could run the XDP code on the same CPU for optimization purposes. And diving deeper, it turns out this code has been introduced in kernel 5.11.11 .11, and also backported to a few Ubuntu kernels. Turns out the ones are impacted, so 20.04.2 and 20.04.3. So all these things start to make sense, and if you remember, there's something very specific happening with AWS, but at this point, we wanted to be, to be sure, and so if we get back to NA Select queue, if you remember, this function here, netdevpictx, is the one we should be using. So before doing anything, we're like, well, is using this function okay for us? And because it's the one we should be using on GCP too, so it should be working. So we look at the code, once again, the code is pretty simple, and there's this very promising function here, uh, which seems like it's computing a hash and allocate and associating a flow to, to a queue that seems uh, perfect, right? Except, if we look at this function itself, there's this very weird logic at the end that reminds us of what ENA Select queue was doing, which is, if the queue was recorded, then restore it. And we're starting to be extremely confused here because, because of this code, uh, we should have the issue on GCP too, right? Uh, because the queue is recorded there too. So we get back to this function here and like, oh, there's this call here called uh, get XPS queue, right? And I don't know if you're familiar with XPS, but it's a uh, transmit packet steering which allows for mapping flows uh, to queues based on the transmitting CPU so you have uh, some form of data locality and some, and some optimizations. It's, it's a good optimization, but we don't use it anywhere. I mean, we haven't configured it anywhere, so that's kind of weird. Still, to be extra sure, we connect it to a GCP host, and, well, turns out, GCP has a magic daemon that actually does some kind of configuration on nodes, and it's setting XPS by default on all the nodes. Turns out, if we disable XPS on GCP, we now have exactly the same issue, which is good news, right? So. Let's go to, to a quick summary of, of, of what we found. So we found that the code in VS XMIT is recording the queue on impacted kernels. At some point after routing, we're going through this function here, the netdev call pictx, which is the function responsible for picking the queue. Then we have two possibilities. If we're on AWS, we're always gonna use ENA select queue, which is gonna say that the queue is recorded and always use the first queue. If we're on GCP, we're gonna use the VRTIO driver and, and there we have two different cases. If XPS is enabled, we will use the queue decided by XPS. If it's disabled, we'll use the XKB takes hash function, which will do exactly the same thing as in a select queue and we'll use a single queue. All things start to make sense. That's good, but now we need to fix it, right? So we, we're kind of lucky because we work with the Cilium team pretty closely and when we started having the issue, we, we pinged them. And we explained to, to them what we found, and Daniel Borkman immediately said, that sounds like a bad bug, let me, let me fix it. And so he created this very simple commit here, which got accepted in a matter of hours and, and merged into the kernel. If, if we get back to the sequence of, of, what's, of events and what's happening in, as we go through different functions in the kernel, you can see here that because now we have a patch kernel, um, the VS XMIT code is not storing the queue anymore, right? So it remains zero. And now, once we reach ENA select queue, we're actually seeing that the queue is not recorded, and so we're gonna now go into netdev pictx, which we were not using before, 
and pick a random queue out between zero and, and seven in our case because we have eight queues. That's great news. However, well, we also have existing nodes, and as Eric was saying, we have tens of thousands, and getting a kernel patch over 10,000 hosts is, is pretty challenging. Turns out, once again, we're lucky because we use Cilium. So we have a daemon set that is loaded on every single host we have, and it actually already instruments uh, the virtual standard device with eBPF code to perform Kubernetes load balancing, but also network policies, and because we have eBPF code there, we can actually modify the SKB. And so what Daniel suggested again is like, maybe we can just use the eBPF code we had to force the queue mapping to zero always. And this is what this code does here. You can see here, we have this very simple function called reset queue mapping that could be called on, anything, on every single packet and just set the field to zero always. So what does it look like now? So you remember, this is for uh, kernels that are impacted, right? So as we go through the VS XMIT code, we store the queue, so it's one, which is something we want to avoid. However, because we have this new patch in eBPF code uh, in, with Cilium, it's actually reset to zero as we go through the VS device, which means we can now pick a queue, and this time it was five, but yeah. So we've, we've been through all this, now what are the results? So the first one is, well, it looks very good. We're now using all the queues, right? So very satisfying. However, it's not the only thing we wanted, right? We also uh, wanted like higher level metrics to look better because this is uh, not really meaningful. So we started looking at throughput and throughput is now much better, right? This is, you have host to host on the left hand side and pod to host on the right hand side and you can see that the numbers are pretty similar, right? We're maxing the instance, which is good news. Also, uh, if, you, if we restart the, state, uh, the, the test with, with plant, so this time we're using FU code in both cases, we can see that it's, it's much better uh, once we've patched the node, right? We're, instead of having 16 gigabits per second, we're getting to 25, which is exactly what the instance provides. What about our applications? So uh, key network metrics start to, to look much better. Right? The, the first metric here is uh, TCP retransmit by, by flow, and you can see that's uh, they're going down immediately after we deploy the patch. And the TCP latency, so this is the SRTT as measured by the socket, was around eight milliseconds, and after the patch, now four milliseconds, which is, of course, much better. And what about business metrics? So this is the one that was, I mean, this is actually the reason we started to do this in the first place. I mean, the reason the teams were complaining was because they had issues with Kafka, or in this example here, they had issues when they were transferring data with a uh, mystery bucket. And you can see here that the P P99 to, for the transfer latency used to be between like two and four seconds, and after the patch, we're now below 0.5 seconds, which is, of course, much better. And this gets us to our, our conclusion. So um, what we wanted to share is, well, uh, achieving top network performance is still hard. Uh, it seems like it's a solved problem, except if uh, cloud providers start to provide us with instances that can do uh, 25 gigabits per second or, or more. And of course, if you want to, to do this efficiently on, on, on Node, it means you have to tune your operating system. And, and of course, interactions between the different components of the network stack are, are, are very complex. But you can see how, I mean, the commit that created the issue was extremely simple, and understanding exact, the exact impact was, uh, took us a lot of time and was, and was pretty challenging. We also wanted to share that, I mean, um, this totally sold us on, on BPF Trace, uh, BPF Trace as, 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 a, as a system team because it allows us to, to, to debug very complex kind of behaviors in, in ways that are uh, pretty easy. And also, in, in some cases, especially on the network side of things, we can actually do things on, on packets and, and mitigate issues without waiting for, for a new kind of release. And, and something we wanted to say also, it's, well, sometimes it's, it's actually a kernel bug. Because of course, when we started, nobody would have guessed it would be a kernel bug. We're like, well, it's probably something we messed up with the configuration, right? Turns out this time it was, it was a kernel bug. If you're interested in details, there's uh, many more details in the, in the, in the issue on the, on the Cilium um, repo. Thank you, thank you very much. Um, if, you're, uh, if you're interested in debugging this kind of uh, weird and funny issues, we're always hiring. And, and we have a few minutes for questions if you, if you have questions for us.
No questions? It was all perfectly clear. <laughs> we tried our best. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you.